I yeah, sometimes try have. to project my fears on Amber and will say, I mean, I think that I would maybe not. And Amber <laughs> will just very like, I don't know, like a gunslinger at the OK Corral says, I'll be fine. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and now that we're at home, we'll never know if I we'll was never fine know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Paley Fest LA. Um, I'm Meredith Blake of the Los Angeles Times, and I'm delighted to be your host of this special Paley Fest conversation honoring Late Night with Seth Meyers. Um, thanks to the festival's official card city for helping this event make this event possible. This program is presented by the Paley Center for Media, a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring excellence in television through education programs, great conversations with the stars and storytellers of critically acclaimed series like the one we celebrate today, and the preservation of television's creative legacy through the Paley Archive. To learn more and to become a member, please visit paleycenter.org. Thank you. Today, we are thrilled to welcome the creative team of NBC's acclaimed series, Late Night with Seth Meyers. Joining us from their living rooms and bedrooms across the tri-state area <laughs> are um, writer Amber Ruffin. Hi, Hi Amber. <laughs> um, writer Jenny Hagel. Hi. Writer and um, head writer and producer Alex Bays. Hi, everybody. Supervising writer, producer, and writer of A Closer Look, Sal Gentile. Hello. Producer, Mike Shoemaker. Hey. And of course, Seth Meyers, joining us from the attic. <laughs> <laughs> when did I know that I would have, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's nice to have you all virtually. Um, how, how is everybody holding up in these weird times? It's nice to have a show to do. I will say that. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, so let's let's talk about um, your your recent milestone. You recently um, filmed your one thousandth show. Um, tell me a little bit about that milestone. What it means to you, and how you think the show has evolved over the years. Maybe pre pandemic, we can talk about that, and we can talk about the recent evolution, which has been pretty vast. I mean, I think the biggest way the show evolved was just from not knowing exactly what we wanted it to be to having a pretty good sense every day. And the biggest change from when we started to where we are now is the idea that we could do long form deep dive political pieces that would be by far the biggest chunk of our show. And that that would be the element that would sort of have the longest tail, both I feel like linear and online. I that, don't think that was a conventional wisdom. We started doing the show in 2014 as far as what were the things people would watch the next day. Uh, I think that people would have told you it was the shorter things, the uh, more celebrity driven things. And, and so we were lucky to find a thing that we were doing because it was interesting to us. And, and then it turned out that it was also interesting to our viewers. Hmm. When did it occur to you that you, you could do something more in depth? I mean, what what's the timeline? Like early 2016, Shoemaker? Is that about yeah, right? I think that's, I mean, I wish I could remember. Every, but yeah, that's about right. And it was slow. We started doing them and uh, and realized we could do them. And then, um, and then we went full speed until uh, we would look for cracks in Sal. And that's, <laughs> what, that's how we would know we had pushed too far. Yeah. <laughs> Just like he got grayer. Yeah. Before Sal, I was doing one a month. And then when Sal came on, we said, you know what might be better? Three a week. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to break him. Yeah. <laughs> she made him do four for a while and it killed him. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we talk a little bit about the process of writing them? I'm really curious kind of how that works because it is a, they're long segments and um, they involve a ton of research. I probably didn't need to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have an incredible team, which is really part a key part of the evolution. Uh, we have an incredible associate producer named Emily Rodas, and she does tons of research for it, an incredible graphics team. And, um, and so it sort of starts from the ground up from there. They were all sort of like trawling through the day's news. And while Emily is researching, um, I'm just sort of thinking about like threads like how to pull everything together neatly into like a thread. Cause it, you know, there, from the beginning of the pandemic, um, there's been this head spinning quality to the Trump era of like all these disparate things happening at once that feel like you have to sort of be like a, 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 a cat following a laser pointer, like over there and then over there. And I think it's useful to as much as possible draw a thread 
to explain, first of all, to plant our feet on the ground of reality and just say what's true and what's not true every day through the lens of comedy. And then also just to like try as much as possible to tie these disparate jumbled things together and explain to you what's going on. Um, so, and then I'm communicating with Seth throughout all of that and Bayes and I write up a first uh, draft and sometimes that's, a, I end up, depending on what's happened that day, sometimes that's a, like a four or five or six in the morning and then, uh, and then uh, they do their passes and then we meet together and we read it and we talk about it, we go over it and then, um, and then I do one final pass and then our incredible production team works on it from there and we, our editors cut clips together and montages and stuff and our graphics team makes graphics and that's pretty much the process of how it works and it's it hasn't changed a ton except for that we kind of do it backwards now where Seth records it and then we are dropping elements in afterwards but that's pretty much the the process yeah um Seth it's kind of a marathon for you to get through those segments especially now that you're your a one-man crew. <laughs> yeah. The, you know, it's funny because I don't flub much in studio when I'm reading off cue cards, and yet there's something about, I think it just comes down to the fact that I, in the back of my head, I can't trick myself into knowing that I can get away with a flub. So if I screw up, I start over on a closer look. Sometimes I screw up and I can scroll back and do it again, but my great shame is knowing that Sal will see my mistake. And <laughs> if it happens late enough in the piece, I really, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, oh, I hate that Sal's going to be able to lord this over me, but I'm not doing, <laughs> no. I'm not doing 12 minutes from the start. Uh, <laughs> but it is insane to talk loudly and angrily into an iPod camera <laughs> just on your own. And be even, no matter how angry you are about the day's news, get even angrier when you stumble on a word. <laughs> uh, but it has been, uh, it's been an education and, you know, it's, it's weird to say because, of course, when we started this, we never wanted them to be so many quarantine shows that we get better at it. But sadly, I think we have gotten a little better at it because of the amount of reps we've had. Yeah. Do you have like a poster of Trump behind the iPad to sort of get you reared up or anything? To Would you believe that I can picture him pretty easily without a poster? <laughs> right. Yeah, you probably don't need that, right? Um, Sal, you, you mentioned, uh, you, you used a great metaphor, the cat following the laser pointer around to, to describe, you know, comedy in the Trump era, or just the news cycle. What has been the biggest challenge for all of you guys, maybe even pre-pandemic, um, being funny in, in this wild new time period we're living through. I mean, monologue jokes are still monologue jokes, right, Baze? Yeah. yeah. They're still monologue jokes. And luckily, I mean, the, this period is horrifying and uh, nightmarish all the time, but luckily it's also very stupid. <laughs> and a lot of really dumb, silly things happen every day. And so there's plenty of material. I mean, you know, the posing with the Goya products in the Oval Office is simultaneously horrifying and stupid. So I'm like, oh, well, at least it's stupid and we can, <laughs> we can talk about that. Um, and you know, and, and Sal can have the horror. <laughs> you, you can cover the horror. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a laser pointer. And you know, um, as far as the monologue jokes go, I'm like, oh, we'll just follow the laser to certain places. <laughs> well, luckily, we have a lot of people who find the different directions in it. Like, like Sal's getting mining one section, the base of the monologue is mining another, and then Amber and Jenny find things that either we don't know about or we don't know how to deal with, and they manage to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, since we're talking about sort of signature um, pieces, I'd love to hear about um, Joke Stuff Can't Tell, which I think has gotten a, a really big response. Um, I'd love to hear about the origins of that. Yeah, jokes Seth can't tell was Jenny's idea. And she thought it would be something we could do on television. And I did not agree. <laughs> I was, um, well, I think I was naive because I was new. So I was like, this is like, anything is a great idea if you like, if you want it to be, or I don't know, I think I just have like a lot of enthusiasm. Um, no, but I just, um, I think it really just came from a very innocent, honest place of um, when I first started, I think I was trying to figure out what jokes I could pitch that worked and what didn't, which I think is so much of the job of a late night show is figuring out where does your voice intersect with the show's voice and the host's voice. And so um, 
really the origin of it was just that there had been one day in the news where there had been some lesbian related headline. I don't remember what it was. Um, I'm sure lesbians had done something very cool. Uh, but, but I had written like a bunch of monologue jokes about it and turned them in and they all got rejected. And then I had, like, said something about it to Faze. And um, I just went like this because he's in the box next to me, like as if that makes sense. <laughs> Days. And um, and he was like, yeah, we can't use those. And I was like, right, right. Seth can't dump on lesbians. That's terrible. Yeah. Um, so just kind of in passing, I said to Amber, I was like, is there something in a segment where we could dump on our respective communities? And I think we just turned it in kind of thinking like, oh, this will be a lark. And, and it just to our great surprise, it, it, it had some traction. And I yeah. think just from our time on Update, you know, Bays, myself and Shoemaker, we've always loved being uh, next to people who were killing. So it was always a delight. As soon as we heard the idea, I think we all knew how well it would work. And I could just be the rube in the middle. But it's so much fun for me because I basically just get to be audience and uh, it doesn't feel like work at all when they come out. And I'm very frustrated with how hard they can bomb and have the audience still like them because I truly... Really, <laughs> it's both of them have exponentially more charm and escapability than I have. <laughs> they still have, it, it lives on groaners. There are so many groaners, especially now that we're, that there's not an audience, but, but the amount that, that they relish, like they love getting hard laughs, but the amount that they relish when something is like so rough and then, and, and then we, they both go after the audience when they dare to groan, it's really, it's something to see uh, 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 in the studio, but it's also great to see at home because you know that, that because they added a little extra. It's a weird part of the writing process too, when you're like, hey, is this joke good? And you're like, yes, I mean, <laughs> it's gonna work. <laughs> That's you also exactly Are you gonna say it on TV? <laughs> then yes. <laughs> Yeah, there's the element of like what's fun on paper and what do you actually want to say in front of a bunch of people. Right. And what do you want to say like in private and what do you say and want to say in front of people? Has there ever been anything that you weren't sure that you should have told? Any jokes you weren't sure that you should have said? I have always been right. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, obviously, yeah. yeah. I no, sometimes try to project my fears on Amber and will say, I mean, I think that I would maybe not, and Amber will just very, like, I don't know, like a gunslinger at the OK Corral says, I'll be fine. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and now that we're at home, we'll never know if we'll I was never fine. Know. <laughs> so let's talk about the last couple of months, which have been um, eventful <laughs> and obviously very challenging for the show in unprecedented ways. Are there, um, sort of unexpected upsides to the last few months, and then we can talk about the challenges. Well, I mean, I think they're, you know, it's weird to say, but we've had to be creative in a way that, you know, we wouldn't have to be in the studio. And I think the biggest fear with a show like this, where you do do a thousand shows in six plus years, there's a fear of falling into a rhythm and a pattern that maybe makes you a little bit less creative. And so that part has been at times sort of exhilarating and, and really fun. Um, and we've used it a lot on really stupid ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stupid ideas. Anything else that people are really enjoying that they it, it didn't expect to um, have as a plus side to the remote production? I mean, I think building out the... So one fun thing, like this would never have been... We never would have anticipated this about a closer look. But like we spend so much time building out the lore of where Seth is, like in his attic and building out. I never thought that I'd spend so much of my time like building out the mythology of an, of an attic in Connecticut. Like, <laughs> the lore. <laughs> And it's also I will say it's like a highlight for me to know because Seth was mentioning before, like sometimes he has to redo things a bunch of times. It, the other like it's a highlight for me to know that like he has to spend a significant amount of his day doing really dumb things like the other day because one thing we really excitedly built out was like, because we knew Seth was changing locations, we turned his attic door into this like magical portal that he stepped through into the, <laughs> into the captain's quarters. Yeah. And I spent my whole break thinking about like where he would enter from. And then he, and then he, we decided he would crawl out of the fireplace. And then how long Seth did you spend like throwing the thorn birds out of the fireplace as if it had been spat out by the magical portal? 
Yeah, Sal wrote in that I, so I had to crawl into the fireplace and then I had a little uh, light that I would turn on because the portal's magic. And then I had to like throw out the thorn birds without my hand showing. <laughs> and I did it like 20 times. And then I had this moment like, why am I doing the light? Nobody cares about this. <laughs> Uh, but it was, uh, there is something about uh, getting in the, I don't know, a different side of the brain than we're usually on for a closer look, I, I feel like is a nice pressure release. Yeah, there's a looseness to the show that is um, enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. The, the absence of an audience, I think, really just takes away the self-consciousness and you can find like new silly places mm -hmm. that you didn't know you had. <laughs> or, right. And you know, and you don't have an audience going, hey, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll keep going. Right. If you bomb, it's you bomb in silence no matter what, right? It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I will say there, I am still sometimes aware, like even in the, a room that no one is in, I sometimes think I'm, I'm bombing right now. <laughs> <laughs> when you turn around to talk to the sea captain or those moments when you're like, I might be, I might be bombing right now. <laughs> yeah, I might be bombing. <laughs> this might be um, a crutch. Um, what, what is, uh, you mentioned the Thornbirds. Have you guys started a Thornbirds book club yet? When's that happening? We haven't, nor have I ever, uh, I should stress, never read the Thornbirds or even You've seen You've got to read it. Except. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, I think I should. When this is all over, I'm going to celebrate by taking a week off and reading the Thornbirds. <laughs> well, that's been one of the most fun kind of running gags during this whole thing. How did that come about? I did the show when we were trying to find a location because I think technically I've maybe done it five different places. Yeah. Um, and I started in a friend's garage and there was a bookshelf behind them and just people online on Twitter pointed out that they're, why does Seth Meyers have the Thornbirds? <laughs> um, and it just struck me that it is really the funniest book. Not, there's nothing funny about it except that I think that it just was everywhere. It was, if you were of a certain age, everyone's mom had the Thornbirds on their bookshelf. Right. And it just, it, and it was also didn't make any sense why I would have it. And so when I left there, I brought it with me. And then we just have kept playing out bits for no one. <laughs> and like, I mean, the amount that I have to like send Shoemaker emails about the fake covers for books I want. Because um, we did a whole series of anagram Thornbirds books, just things that sounded like Thornbirds. <laughs> it's we so did. much harder than normal work because like an artist has to send it and send it to someone else to print it and someone else to wrap it in a book. And it takes weeks. <laughs> and like things that would be normal in a studio just takes weeks and like Seth has these little flights of fan fancy and I just have to send it off to p these poor other people who are just rolling their eyes at the nonsense of it. And uh, also, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys know, uh, the mail is basically a virus super spreader and mm -hmm. my wife has really pleaded with me to try to minimize the amount of packages we get. And when boxes show up, the amount she said, please tell me that's not another copy of the f***ing Thornbirds. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, you know what occurred to me the other day, because I was thinking about like, what was the first time? The first time we acknowledged it, we invited people to participate in a contest where they guess what's up with Seth's copy of the Thornbirds. And we set up an email address called what's up with Seth's copy of the Thornbirds at gmail.com <laughs> where we invited people to, in, to send their guesses why he has a copy of the Thornbirds. But we made clear at the time, and we've kept to this promise, that we will never once check that email. We will never read anybody's guesses. And uh, we still haven't to this day. But there are probably a bunch of them in there. <laughs> oh, a bunch. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the house on a bunch. <laughs> So that's why you haven't responded to my emails. <laughs> but, sorry. And you, you can just DM me directly if you have any. <laughs> good, good, good. Seth, did your mom have it on her bookshelf? You know, I bet my mom would say she didn't. I don't remember <laughs> ever seeing it on my mom's bookshelf. Um, my mom, w uh, who's a huge snob when it comes to literature, uh, I bet would say that the Thornbirds uh, was beneath her. Yeah. Right. Know, While reading it behind the cover of another cover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so what has been, ha have you guys had any, like, can I use four-letter words? Have you had any, like, moments 
in, in the past couple of months, moments where you were, things got really hairy or um, the production was just kind of bumpy from home or any, any big challenges? I mean, not, not fun stories. They're all just like, oh, when, when Seth's doing an interview and you could see the other person just free, like their, their internet freezes. Like it's, we're at the mercy of, of everyone's bad internet. And every day there's like two guests and some of them just might have a bad one and they don't know. And, uh, and it, and it like, and that's at the end of the day when it's the last thing. So if, an, if, if all of a sudden we have to cancel an interview, there was like, there was nothing else to do. Like, like Seth would have to talk to himself. So it would, it was, it made my heart stop like maybe five or six times. It's better now. I think, you know, everyone has to zoom with their family. So they found out if they can get on the internet since then. But at the beginning, it was people who were completely computer illiterate. <laughs> it is because ultimately like the best we can do is control it on our end. And, you know, that's been a challenge in its own right. But, you know, then you're basically flipping a coin when it gets down to how good the internet is. I remember early on Shoemaker just talking to Ricky Gervais where you're, you know, Zoom and with someone in England and it just fully cuts out and uh uh and which is lucky because he was probably saying something <laughs> you know. uh but uh Ricky. those were the moments where you were just you know when someone would freeze and you're just sitting in an empty attic and you just feel the sweat and you're just like what are we gonna do now like what is this why are we doing a television show like this <laughs> yeah yeah amber it looked like you had something to add Dude, <laughs> um, once we had to shoot some Amber Says What or something like that, where it was just me, and they've given me a bunch of things called loom cubes. Yeah. If someone sends you a loom cube, punch them right in the face. <laughs> These things last as long as they feel like lasting. Oh. You have to have them plugged in. Sometimes they still don't go. So I had charged them, but then one wasn't charged. So we get halfway through, they both die okay so now we're up against the clock seth has to do his interviews seth does his interviews then we have to come back to meet now this leaves us the tiniest little bit of time before we have to turn in the show so we have this tiny little bit of time we're all kind of rushing a little bit and i hastily put up the loom cubes and uh <laughs> i get to the end blah 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 this has been amber says what click and the lights go off right at the last <laughs> possible second so it's like a little bit shorter you know than the breath you would give it afterwards because it just cut out right in the nick of time so i asked them for a ring light and now that's what i use here's a here are the loom cues by the way if you're oh my god look at that look at those wires here's look oh. at this what a mess this is this wow. is cool. yeah that's yeah. just a that's a white sheet over a piece of cardboard <laughs> it's very high tech yeah yeah, I have a white sheet over my window right now. We all have the jankiest setups in our home. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. If I turn my camera that way, it's a pile of toys. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, tell maybe that's a good way to tell me just a little bit about what you guys have to do to perform. What what's involved in prepping that um, from home? I'm guessing a lot of virus ridden packages and things like that. Yeah, because Amber, you have some prop. You've had some prop heavy sketches, and so have you, Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, I think had the most props of. Any sketch? Yeah, describe your sketch, Jenny. I wrote the biggest piece of nonsense ever, Meredith. There's, I mean, you've ever wondered if Seth Meyers is a generous boss <laughs> do this thing on his television show. I just wrote a sketch where I was like, hey man, we all have to wash our hands a lot, but it's important to do it the right way. And I'm gonna tell you, and then I just casually go like this to brush hair out of my hand and my hand is a skeleton hand. <laughs> washed it so many times. Right. Never helped me write this sketch and, and another writer, John Lutz, and I just keep talking and doing different motions with my hands and they just are skeletons and it just kind of gets more absurd. But for each different thing, like at one point I count to three, at one point I put glasses on, for each thing, each thing required a different skeleton hand because I couldn't change the positions that fast. So by the time, so the awesome art department made like 15 different pairs of skeleton hands all doing different things. They brought them to my house. And then like I like set up three or four tables around me. And then when I shot it, it was like, I was just picking up all these different hands and like, but it was like, so the, but the art department was so great. They like figured out a way, like, okay, we can't be there to help her. What do we need to do to make it so that she can do our job herself while she's doing her job? 
So they also like dropped off all these like long dowels and masking tape and super glue. And they're like, if you need to change it, here's how you do it. Like it was, it was really awesome to watch them figure out how to do their job through me. Mm. For the nonsensinest sketch of all time. <laughs> so you could get the hot, hot take, my, my hands are dry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad America got that message. <laughs> we noticed too, that by the time we like shot it because of everything, it was like three months after people have been talking about hand washing. <laughs> Nobody cares about that anymore. It's so far past like, hey, you know what the worst part about this is? Dry hands. <laughs> oh. Still relevant, still relevant. Yeah. Yeah, we're um, we're ready to do our Tiger King sketch. <laughs> <laughs> any day now, any day now. Um, how about you, Seth and Amber? What's the kind of um, biggest headache or, or, you know, what's involved in getting ready for a day on, on camera? I, you know, I have to do my own makeup, which I've, uh, I don't need to tell you, I've never had to do at this level. Um, and then the biggest thing is just, I have to, for interviews, uh, you know, I have to record, I record sound on a separate track via a lav that's running into my iPhone. And I would say once a week I look down because that's also how I'm timing the interview and I realize I haven't started it yet. And that is a moment where I realize then we got to take the sound off the source and it's going to be bad. And, you know, again, I think their audience is pretty patient with what we're all going through as far as like what they're willing to accept, but it always bums me out when I've then forced them to accept even less. <laughs> um, and uh, it is true. These loom cubes are really nice lights, but they uh, are battery sucks. And uh, all of a sudden, like you, you will, be, I'll be halfway through an interview and realize, oh, I don't think that one's plugged in and it is. <laughs> Oh, any second. <laughs> oh, no. And then it does seem very passive aggressive if you're interviewing someone who makes it sound like they're so boring, you just turn the lights off. <laughs> like, okay, again that. <laughs> right. Um, for the writer, says your has your process changed at all by not being in in um, you know the same shared physical space? Has it just gotten more efficient, or do you miss kind of the camaraderie of being in an office? Um, it's, well, it's definitely streamlined for <laughs> um, there's a lot of <laughs> meetings we used to have that don't exist anymore. Um, as far as like the monologue goes now, we used to, I used to get from the monologue writers, probably about 400 jokes that I would pare down to a packet of maybe 200. And then we would go into Seth's office and he would read all 200 out loud with a highlighter in his hand and all the writers sitting around to select the monologue jokes. And now there's just not viable to do. I mean, we could have a Zoom meeting, but there's no time because he's loom cubing or he's talking to somebody else, interviewing somebody. So we just were like, I'll, I'll just pick the jokes. Because <laughs> I've been working with Seth for like 15 years now. And I'm like, I think I mostly know what will work and what he'll like. And then I'll throw in a couple that I like <laughs> that people hate, <laughs> maybe they'll notice. Um, so that has gotten a lot cleaner. I don't know if it's better, <laughs> but um, it's a lot uh, faster and more streamlined. I've actually kind of got the best deal, I think, out of this whole Zoom because I don't have any props. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I, I'll just pick the jokes I like and uh, we'll get on with it. <laughs> we can get you some. We can get you some loom cubes if you want. I should. I've got yeah. guilt. I should use props for our <laughs> meetings. <laughs> but I, while I miss seeing the writers face to face, that every day, like sitting with 200 jokes, knowing that our monologue, like basically 200 yields 12. And I love reading those 12 on air for our show. I don't love reading the other 188 in front of the guys uh, who, who wrote them. So yeah. for me, it's this joy, it's joyful to get the email from Bayes of, hey, here's 15 jokes. And I think the quality has been outstanding. And so I really uh, commend uh, all the writers for keeping the quality high without being able to bounce it off people um, because it's been really fun to do the monologue jokes. It is amazing what they've been able to do under these circumstances. Um, I, I love them as well. And if you see them, let them know. <laughs> <laughs> I should say the thing I miss the most is just walking into the writer's room and interrupting everyone's flow so that I can talk about a TV show or movie I've watched. <laughs> We tried to do that today. We had a writer's meeting today. We hadn't had one in week. We were on hiatus. And uh, instead of, Seth kept wanting to talk about 
the uh, a movie he saw and really just killed the whole room five times. I wanted to talk about the old guard and I may destroy you. And yeah. I feel like both of those are good uses of our time uh, because I am with my in-laws whose uh, television tastes I do not share. <laughs> Right. They're watching the thorn birds. <laughs> They're watching the thorn birds. <laughs> Being real judgy about my bits. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit, one thing that hasn't changed um, sort of during this period is you have a, and, and something that I think makes the show special is you have a kind of an interesting array of guests um, for a late night show. You don't just have your typical, you have plenty of celebrities, but you also have politicians and journalists and authors. Um, Seth, and I'm just kind of wondering what sort of range you try and get and sort of what the prep involves for you. Well, we have, again, we have really great segment producers. So, you know, the range, as the range expands, you know, them, uh, I should say they and their research team do a great job of just getting me ready and, you know, sending me packs the night before that I could read through. And I do still try as hard as I can to, you know, watch the show or the movie or, or read some of the book before I talk to people. But, you know, it's been a nice time. I think for us, you know, what was a really important week was after the weekend of, of uh, the Floyd protests. And obviously for very good reasons, anyone who was promoting a project rightfully backed out of going on talk shows to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And we were really lucky uh, to be able to pull from, you know, friends of the show like Michael Che, like Leslie Jones, who came on and, and were able to give voice to it in a way that I mean, certainly I couldn't have. And that was a really uh, nice week in, insofar as I think that it really did matter who we had on and we were lucky to be able to find the right people. Yeah, yeah. Um, that reminds me of uh, the terrific segments that Amber did talking about um, her experiences with the police. Amber, I'm kind of curious about what sort of response you've gotten to those pieces from, from I don't know, online or from where, wherever it might be. I, I assume it's been positive. No one said anything crazy. I'm shocked. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm going to say this on the show. There goes Twitter for like a month. But everyone said, a lot of people said, it, it was usually either. Wow, I can't believe that happened. I had no idea. Or, girl, I know. Listen to this story. And it was only those two <laughs> responses. So, yeah, the response has been positive. But even now, people are still saying, you know, kind of like passing it around. You know, I'll see that someone has had a conversation with someone and then they'll go, oh, and you know what else you should do is check out these stories. Um, I guess it was news to some people. <laughs> some people were surprised that you went through these experiences? Girl, some people were a little surprised, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which itself is probably not surprising, but disappointing. Hey, bless. I wish I didn't know. It must be nice. <laughs> now well, now we I, have to have a bad time. This is not, you know, uncommon for our show that when things like this happen that we, we immediately can recognize that Amber will, will be able to speak to them better than us. And so we, we sort of go to her uh, or her and Jenny or, or her and Jenny and Allie, depending on what the topic is, and, and basically ask them to solve it on our behalf. And... I will admit that when after Amber did one and said I can keep doing them all week, you know, even I, there was a degree of surprise that even I had knowing that the length that she could she could string it out. But it was wonderful to be in a situation where, you know, we have so much confidence in in how she's going to perform it and how she's going to write it. Uh, so it was it was a special thing to be able to start the show with. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, I know that you've, you've talked a lot about being an ally on the show and you've obviously given a platform to Amber and to other people on the show to talk about things that maybe five or 10 years ago weren't getting a lot of um, uh, room or space in late night TV or in comedy in general. Is that something that's become more important to you over the years, say, compared to when you first started? Yeah, absolutely. I think the interesting thing is when we started, we thought the way that we would get our writing staff in front of camera because we did hire a lot of uh, writers with a background in performing, we thought that they would play more characters and do sillier comedy bits. And that sort of didn't work. And it wasn't a part of the show that was clicking. And then it took about 18 months for us to basically put down a base coat as to what our show was. And once we had that down, 
we started, our writers started coming on more and instead of playing characters, they started playing themselves and, and sharing their perspectives. And again, you know, it's not like it's a sacrifice on my part because it was immediately, we could tell really good show content. It was unique and the audience respond to it really well, pretty, pretty immediately once, you know, when I think about, it's not like, Oh, the early days of Amber says what was a real grind. <laughs> like people were into it right away. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, this, uh, we have a question from the festival sponsor city, which I think feeds nicely here, but um, can you comment on how the, how the show balances humor and serious issues on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, when, you know, with a closer look, I think the thing that we always go back to is just trying to, you know, sound builds this incredible framework um, that we get to look through and try to, it will support as many jokes as you want to put on it. And because of that, you can get as much comedy in as possible without it distorting what the core message was when he first wrote it. And so, you know, our, our, goal with that especially is as much important information as possible with as many jokes as we can fit in while keeping the message clean. Yeah, yeah. Um, any of the writers want to add to that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do think like it is very fun. Like it's the fun part, really to see what you can get away with saying because you if you say a hard truth you know my opening the show is the exception then you have to balance it out with doofiness well i know that i do so like to find that balance is really really fun yeah and hard <laughs> <laughs> right right anyone else thoughts <laughs> i mean with that I was just going to say the only good news about of the horror is that it's a shared experience that, you know, the audience is all living through the horror as well. So it's easy to find uh, the truths that you want to get across. And from there, it's a short jump to the jokes, you know, so it's not like <laughs> we're all in jail, but you're free and we're going to tell you jokes about jail. And it's like, no, everybody's in jail. <laughs> Uh, we all know how jail works, right, you guys? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, that's the only thing. Thank God we're all in it together. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Alex and Alex and Mike, you've worked, both worked with Seth for a long time, right? 15 years or something? Something yeah. like that. I think it's... <laughs> um, from your perspective, where, when do you think sort of Seth found his, his voice as the, as the host? He, he can go on mute. He doesn't have to hear this. Um, I feel like early next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any day now. Any day now. <laughs> uh, I feel like all these years it's just been uh, uh, like he always had his voice, uh, and it but it changed as as times changed. Um, uh, you know, I, Seth and I started together. Uh, uh, well, he started. <laughs> I was already there, but at SNL, and it was at first a challenge to find the best way to use Seth. Uh, because he was so good at himself, and that's a show that celebrates characters. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, we just landed on uh, like smart and self-aware, and uh, uh, and it and it kind of kept going. And the and the character that you saw on Update was already what Seth like year five. Yeah, six maybe. Yeah, so uh, he was already comfortable on camera, and then. Uh, and then the update guy became the late night guy. And it was, it, it, it was pretty smooth, but it, what took the long time was um, how to uh, really do that deep thing where you, where you really like, we would, you would do a thing called really uh, on, uh, on update, which was, we thought the extent of which that we could listen to him talk. <laughs> and it turned out it, it was uh, it was a fraction, <laughs> but, it was, it, but it was all, it started, it's still all set. I don't feel that you changed or that you found your voice. I feel like people just got used to it. <laughs> <laughs> and you sat down. Yeah. 
that remember, when that, remember when the world was so simple that was earth shaking <laughs> <laughs> right it's like when obama wore the tan suit that was yeah. wild <laughs> um what seth what lessons did you take from from snl when you when you started the show i mean i, I assume a zillion all of them but yeah any ones that stand out embarrassing the ones you sort of forgot and had to learn again i mean you know was that sitting down was this weird you know, attempted flex to show I could do other things. And the reality is it's okay to be good at one thing in television. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and ultimately the most important thing was you just realized that SNL, you succeed when you're surrounded by, you know, for me, especially a really strong writing staff, which is why we took that so seriously. And, you know, then, uh, you know, just a crew and, and, and department heads that, you know, ultimately, if you hire the right people, then you personally don't ever waste a second worrying about things like lighting or wardrobe or sound. And, and that frees you up to do what you got into this for, which is just writing jokes. Mm, right. Um, has it, have you felt, you know, since the show started six years ago, late night, the landscape has changed. It's gotten more crowded. There's more competition. Um, how, have you felt the pressure to sort of differentiate yourselves or do you, do you sort of just try and focus on the show itself and not think about the broad, broader picture? Yeah, I think we all, as, as long as you play to your strengths, I feel like we all self-differentiate. And, um, you know, I will say, we try hard not to do something where we're very aware we will do the second best version of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are times where we'll come up with an idea and, and just sort of honestly assess it and say, you know, that does seem like a better idea for show X. And I wouldn't want to get caught being the, you know, silver medalist. All right. Anyone so else? no scooter karaoke. <laughs> the acoustics on a scooter will be terrible i cannot it's a loud motor you can't roll the windows up why do you keep pushing this i will say now that you're in an attic and there's no audience there we have been slightly more liberated to have you sing a little bit yeah oh it's been yeah, i would never sing in front of an audience <laughs> just only in front of a karaoke bar kind of yeah thing. just like Although the acoustics in the captain's quarters are worse. I was really feeling it in the attic. I was, it was like shower acoustics. Where you really <laughs> think, oh yeah, I, was, do, I do sound like meatloaf. <laughs> you remember the time when, this was a few weeks ago when I, for some reason, I don't remember why, I wrote in you singing the crazy train lyrics. And yeah. you were like, Dude, that, that morning you were like, yeah, crazy train's a great song. And you were, and then you sang it and I watched the take and you were like so proud with how well you sang it. And then like, we realized like hours later before, almost before then that you just sang the wrong lyrics. Yeah. You just got it. You said, you said uh, something, what are the lyrics? It was like uh, going off the road on a crazy train is what yeah. you said. <laughs> That's the tracks. Yeah. Is it tracks? Rails? It's rails. 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 Thank you. And I should be a real Aussie <laughs> fan. <laughs> the, the real bummer is when you tell your family you're done for the day and then your phone beeps <laughs> and you say I have to go back up to the attic and re-record myself singing uh, Crazy Train <laughs> and then your two-year-old who barely can put a sentence together says I thought your show was about the news <laughs> 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 right, right. For such a topical show, I'm kind of curious what everyone's sort of media diet is. Do you guys um, share a lot of news stories? Are you watching lots of cable news? I'm just kind of curious how, how that works. Everything, I guess. Deep <laughs> <laughs> <Sigh. laughs> yeah. Just every single thing that exists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, Sal, really, you watch a lot, but you also read a lot. You bet you first see things on Twitter, right? And then that points you? Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of like, I, yeah, I'm like, ever, I guess like Twitter's kind of my news feed, like I would say probably is the case for most people. And then just branch out from there, but also like try to make an effort as much as possible to read, to like go to things first, you know, like, like remind yourself that like, aside from surfing Twitter to like, hey, maybe I should also like go read like page 26 of the newspaper instead of just like constantly surfing Twitter all day. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're, you, it's hard to be not inundated constantly. Um, so just, 
just everything all the time. <laughs> now, do you take a break when we take a break? Like, like, the, like, uh, do you not um, like on hiatus? Did you feel you had to keep up, or that's just Sal's brain? I try so hard, Shu. I try so hard to take the break, but there's this only intervention. This is not about it. It's not about... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but then, like Seth and I will like start angrily texting about things, mainly because no one else around us wants to hear about it anymore. <laughs> so we need to like get it out. And so, um, like Seth will just be like, "Did you read this?" And then I'll send him like six text messages, and that's just because like my wife was like, "Go in a different room, talk to someone else, please." <laughs> like well, I, I feel like it's like a rage, a hot rage potato, where it's like. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and then I text Sal, and then I know he has the rage potato, and I can like have dinner. <laughs> and then I know when it's over, I'll have seven rage potato texts, and then I'll have to be like, ah! <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. the game of hot rage potato. Yeah, yeah. hot rage potato. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Alex, or Jenny, or Amber? What are you sort of consuming all day long? I'm finding that um, I'm consuming as much news as I was when we were in the studio, but mm -hmm. now you're watching TV and looking at Twitter three times as much right I'm like oh i also have time for uh light stuff and uh good drama and other things so it's like uh, yeah i guess my diet hasn't changed but uh i also get candy now <laughs> you also get what i also get candy <laughs> right. poison <laughs> right right um what do you think makes the show um the writing on the show stand out or the process maybe I think we're, I mean, I, you know, if I have any skill, it's to be verbal. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm really lucky that I have a writing staff that can write in a style that is fun to say quickly. It's fun to say with precision and it's never, it would be a waste of time to give me just, here's an area, <laughs> like you need to give me the words. And I like things that are written efficiently. And I, I, you know, I think pound for pound, I think we can get, we get as many jokes into the show as anyone could. Um, and that, I'm certainly proud of that. Mm -hmm. What are the, for the writers, um, is there something that you need to know when you write for Seth? Like people who write for certain comedians and certain shows have to, you know, this is a thing that he does like, this is a thing he doesn't like. Is there something that Seth, um, that you writers should know when they're writing for Seth? <laughs> I'm putting Seth on the spot. He loves this. <laughs> no, I think what Seth said is right. I think, I mean, I, I think, yeah, like when I write for Seth, I try to write efficiently with precision and, and then to circle back to things he said earlier and with a point of view. And I think what I like about that is either I'll look at a new story and try to think what is the point of view that will match where Seth is, or if it's something that's more close to home, I'll try to think like, well, what is my authentic point of view? And if I bring that to the table and if it's well written, then I think he'll respond to it. I think, I think really like a thing that I always feel like our show tries to have is a clear point of view. And that feels good to me because it doesn't feel like I'm gonna guess what's funny about this. I'm gonna tell you what's funny to me about this. And people might respond and they might not, but it feels like that's the place that we all kind of try to come from. Right. Yeah, I think uh, the best thing from my point of view is to have, I won't speak for all the writers, but the host is smarter than me, which is a delight. <laughs> I never have to like go, this is what this means. <laughs> this happened in the news today. I, you know, there have been times when I've worked with other persons <laughs> that guy's the president of France, so you see, that's why the cheese. Never mind. <laughs> that is like a couple of steps in front of you, so you can just go here. Here's this, and uh, you never, you never have that extra worry. <laughs> you don't have to explain too much. No. No. I, would, I just, I, I also just want to. I think what Jenny said is totally rings so true to me it's like it's such a, a thing that just occurred to me about that is like it's such an inviting and encouraging way to write like I never feel I don't think I've ever felt like scared that like you know Seth wasn't gonna like something or it was gonna like he might cut things or change things that he doesn't like or don't work for him but like it's such a like you know that he wants you to process things through your point of view he wants perspective and also it's a great and challenging way to write like to make sure you're writing things as precise as possible to like work your jokes to think like to go through a second and third pass on your jokes and make them better but like it's never been like 
for me at least, like it's never been a scary thing. Like it's never been, yeah. it's always been like so encouraging and, and that's what makes it fun that you know you're like challenging yourself to be as, as, as specific in your point of view and work as hard on your jokes as possible because it'll only be rewarded and encouraged and he'll collaborate and work with you on that. Yeah, there isn't a scoreboard where you're like, I'm losing points yeah. with this bad idea. Right, right. I definitely have written some of the worst stuff Seth has ever said. <laughs> um, you guys, that was uh, very flattering and uh, was so nice to hear. I now give you permission to talk about the fact that like once a week, there's a word that I will stumble over multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sal will sometimes do me the courtesy of just changing it to a dumber <laughs> word. Yeah. And then other times he'll leave it in. And I had like in the studio, I was the only story, my eyeline, uh, during a closer look is I can see the outlines of uh, Shoemaker, Bayes, and Sal. And sometimes I will screw it up again on air and Sal throws up his hands <laughs> like a Muppet. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> and I just like laugh like this. I shake my shoulders. <laughs> I have to watch these silhouettes like just like having a heyday over how badly I just muffed it. <laughs> Um, well, guys, it's just about time for the last question, and um, I'm kind of curious um, when we finally um, go back to normal and you go back to 30 Rock. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get there? That's a good question. Wow! Clean out my fridge. <laughs> <laughs> right. Gee, I want to say like hug each other, but that but that probably won't. That probably won't be allowed. That's the one thing we won't be allowed to do. That'll be the rule. Right. Um, I think that we all really miss each other because this doesn't, this isn't the same. And, uh, and I think it's just like what Seth tried to do today, like talking about the shows that he liked. I think that is what we want to do. We kind of want to hang out. Like I really miss passing people in the hallway and saying, oh, I, that thing was so, or just, like like things that came out of uh, uh, standing around literal literal water cooler stuff. It's really it's really a shame to have lost that. That's what I would love to get back. I, I you can still talk to people, but I I will never believe that these Zoom things can't get hacked. And so what I miss <laughs> having uh, someone come in my office, say to them, close the door, and then just talk shit about people. <laughs> Like just like talk. No one in the yeah. office, though. Yes, no, or maybe, but just <laughs> the freedom to like not have devices recording and just even about people you love like that. There's just such a hole in my life there. A Amber, <laughs> what's the thing that you say at the at, at the end when we have like an official meeting and then <laughs> we? I love to whatever set the shoe and I have a meeting. Uh, I we are businessmen. And we get our business done. And then I get up to leave. Every time I get up to leave and then I go, oh, do we have anything we need to say before I open this door? <laughs> <laughs> Is there gossip that needs to be said? <laughs> and they're always. <laughs> um, me and Amber's special place is the ladies room at work if we need to gossip. And I just told Amber this morning, we were on another call about something else. And I said, at some point soon, I'm going to FaceTime you from my bathroom. And I want you to be in your bathroom. Just to try to get something back. We're going to gossip so we can get that feeling of being in the ladies room being like, and then. <laughs> also, our gossip is the nothingest crap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Work with my, one of us is more boring than the last. <laughs> but let someone wear a new shirt and it's on. <laughs> Remember new shirts? Yeah. Oh, I don't. <laughs> we have to, you guys, that makes me, we should start a GoFundMe for Scollin so that when he comes back, he has just tons of new clothes. <laughs> Love it. Um, how about the rest of you? What do you, what do you, what's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, there's a community bowl of M&Ms at the front <laughs> of the <laughs> Nice and fresh. I'm going to plunge my forearm into it. <laughs> Baze, no, you'll get yes, No, I will. Baze. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'll get you some M&Ms. All right. Have but I will have put my hand in <laughs> Seriously, that was it. 
I think that's, <laughs> that's all I want. Sal's just going to eat your M&Ms. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know. Wait, there's a community bowl of M&Ms? I didn't even know about that. You don't have time for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll go check out my Muppet spot where I throw my hands up in the air, but it, it'll be with affection. I won't, I'll be angry, but also like, it'll be like uh, very emotional. I'll, I'll think, uh, the first time Seth gets a, a, a word wrong and I'm angrily like shaking Bays by the shoulders going like, but we told him how to pronounce it before. <laughs> Get off me. <laughs> What's a word he got wrong? Oh my God. Uh, it, you know, what the best is when he would, practice a word <laughs> all day long and then get it right and then f up the next three words. <laughs> That's when I get the really hard squeeze. I mean, the classic, and if, in fairness to Seth, I would overuse it, was plutocrat. Like, for a while, he pronounced it like the planet, like plutocrat, like, or Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, somebody sent me a very helpful, I got Quinnipiac wrong the other day. It's you did it again just now. No, I know I'm trying to, I want to make sure everybody's listening knows that's wrong. Quinnipiac. <laughs> Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not so much a mispronunciation as a labored pronunciation. Oh yeah, that's the thing, is if they've talked to me all day, I'll be like, and according to the new Quinnipiac poll. <laughs> <laughs> right, pause. <laughs> um, well, that's about all the time we have, but it's been really fun to talk to all of you. And um, uh, thank you for joining us for this special Paley Fest LA conversation with the creative team behind Late Night with Seth Meyers. Um, thank you again to the festival's official card city. And you can learn more about the Paley Center by visiting paley.org. Thanks everybody and stay safe. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.